I'm very excited to introduce our next presenter, Jake Javier, who just finished his freshman year at Cal Poly. Um, a year late, um, had anticipated on enrolling in the fall of 17 and playing offensive line for the Mustang football team um, before he had a spinal cord injury. Went through a year of therapy, reevaluated his priorities, um, and really was inspired to change directions from a mechanical engineering major into biomedical engineering. So we've been very excited to get him. And one of the things maybe not listed in the bio on Jake that, that I want to get across, and I'm sure you will see when he comes up and talks, is, is the mindset and the, the, the wisdom that he seems to have developed at such a young age. The acceptance of the situation that he is in, um, combined with a, a very fierce determination to make it be a, not a defining feature of him, but a inspirational feature for him. Jake? Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Cardinal, and thank you to CIRM and everyone that put this wonderful event together. I'm really honored to be here and be able to talk to you guys. and. Uh, he really set the standard high for my speech, so thanks for that. Um, hope I delivered. But um, yeah, thank you. Like he said, I just finished my first year at Cal Poly, and uh, I'm a biomedical engineering student there. So after my first year, I'm still trying to figure out what that really means. And uh, no, I'm kidding, but actually just trying to figure out what I want to do with it, or it's more of kind of what I don't want to do with it because it's so broad, just kind of figuring things out and uh, finding things that I want to try to do in this field, so it's exciting, but glad I could make it. Um, after my first year, I realized it was definitely a big, big adjustment for me going to school, as it is for any student, but uh, I had my own twist on it as it was my first year kind of going off since I had my spinal cord injury. So about two years ago, uh, on June 9th, 2016, I was at a friend's house. Um, it's the last day of high school, day before my high school graduation, and we were all just hanging out, swimming in the pool, and I was diving into the pool, and uh, Dove in one too many times, went a little too far, ended up hitting my head on the bottom of the pool and broke my neck and became immediately paralyzed. And so from there, uh, luckily I had, I had friends there who noticed that I wasn't coming up and they were able to pull me out of the pool and call an ambulance, and which was able to come and rush me over to the nearest field where I got airlifted to the nearest hospital and rushed into emergency surgery to stabilize my neck. And so from what I remember from that day, I remember all the events leading up to that day. I remember the moment I jumped in the pool, the impact, my initial thoughts. I had known immediately that something had definitely gone wrong. I definitely hurt myself. I wasn't able to move anything at first. And uh, my second thought was, does anyone know I'm down here? Because I, I had no idea that, that I couldn't move. I didn't know if they knew I couldn't move and I had started to drown. But luckily they, they were able to pull me out. And next thing I remember is being on the side of the pool and looking up and seeing everyone and um, kind of talking to the paramedics and then going to the hospital and talking to different doctors. Unfortunately, I didn't remember the helicopter ride. That would have been kind of cool. But uh, <laughs> nope, just remember talking to paramedics and stuff like that. So um, from there, I don't remember anything for the next seven days. That's kind of the fun side effects of a lot of painkillers. But i um, kind of glad I don't because I don't think it was a very fun experience. But um, so when I came to, I I found out I had broken my C6 vertebrae and crushed my spinal cord, something, a complete spinal cord injury, and had discovered that I was lucky to be alive. Um, I found out afterward, talking to my mom, that she was speaking to the surgeon that did my procedure, and he'd showed her the MRIs and was saying that, I don't know if you realize the substantial amount of trauma he received here, but it's kind of a miracle that he's still here, that he may not have made it. Made it. So, um, I think I'm very blessed in that sense, but as I've gone, I've kind of figured out what being a quadriplegic is. So I'm a C6 quadriplegic. What that is is complete paralysis from the chest down, including hands and partial paralysis in my arms, among with other organs and things like that. But um, pretty much that's what it is, and that's what I've gone to, to learn to deal with throughout my life. But um, in the beginning, it was definitely um, a lot more. I wasn't able to move anything at first, and as I progressed, so I'd move my arms a little bit, and then kind of from there, there's a lot of natural recovery. But one of the big things at first was I had a lot of respiratory issues. Um, because I was drowning a little bit, I ended up getting pneumonia, and uh, both my lungs collapsed, and I wasn't able to have the 
strength from my diaphragm or from my core muscles to be able to control my own breathing. So um, resulted in this cute little scar up here. I don't know if you can see it on the screen, but um, I had an emergency tracheotomy. I wasn't able to breathe. Um, and that saved my life because I wasn't able to breathe. Obviously, you can't live. You guys are scientists. Um, <laughs> and so from, um, from there, yeah, I was on a vent, and that really sucked. But um, that's one of the first things I, I kind of learned to do was that was really the first, the hardest part. I wasn't focused on the paralysis, on anything else. It was just breaths, one by one, because it's such a thing you don't think about. But it was something I had to constantly think about, because I couldn't do it on my own. I had a ventilator, and it was pushing breath in and out, and just constantly, even through the night and everything like that, just had to focus on that. But the thing I knew is it was temporary, that I would get through it. And that's kind of how I established my whole mindset going to therapy, is it's a lot of goals that you try to reach. And it starts with the little things, day by day, and they stack. And so I started with a respiratory, and then it went toward more functional goals and tasks, learning how to dress myself, learning how to feed myself, learning how to live on my own. And then eventually there was the big goal to get back to Cal Poly, as Dr. Cardinal was saying. So being able to go through my daily life as a quadriplegic um, with a disability that I really knew nothing about before. Um, so as I kind of was able to go, kind of stacking those goals. Um, and so one of the things that I had the great opportunity to do was when I was in the ICU, uh, when I first came to, it was probably about a week after, we had gotten a random call from an unknown phone number. Well, my mom did. And luckily she answered it because it was Dr. Gary Steinberg from Stanford. Um, he had heard about me and he wanted to present me the opportunity to participate in a stem cell trial. And I had no idea what that was. My parents had no idea what that was, but it ended up being the Asterius Biotherapeutic uh, AST OPC1 uh, phase two stem cell trial. And um, I remember the phone calls on speakerphone. I couldn't talk at the time because I was ventilated. Um, so I was a bit out of the conversation. And I'm sitting there trying to absorb all this knowledge, and I'm relying on high school freshman year biology and the little bit of energy I had left. Um, I think I ended up falling asleep, but um, when I came to, I, I'd, I'd gotten the gist of it. But he wanted me to participate in the trial. He was very excited about it. It was really exciting, and I was discussing the options with my parents because we had heard about a great facility called Craig Hospital in Colorado, and it's, well, I think it's the greatest um, acute spinal cord injury care center in the world. It's, it's awesome. And we had heard about it through different people who reached out to us, and so we really wanted to go there. But if we were to participate in the study, then we would have to go to Santa Clara Valley Medical Center, which is another great facility, but we kind of had plans already. But um, I discussed the different options and realized, you know, there's, it's a great opportunity. I didn't know a lot about it, but um, decided to go forward, didn't have much to lose, and ended up going to Santa Clara, even though it could risk my insurance-wise being able to go back to Craig for therapy. Because um, I knew when I was there, they had to monitor me. But I didn't know exactly what I was getting into um, until I got there, and I had to first qualify for the trial because it had to be like the best of the worst to really kind of get the stem cells. Um, so it took a while, but they had to test me multiple times um, to make sure that I was able to qualify for the trial. And I used this time to, one, be able to heal respiratory and other health medical issues, um, get off the ventilator, and then also to um, really talk to them and try to learn about stem cells as much as I could because I knew nothing about this. I was still learning about spinal cord injury, and then I have to learn about stem cells. So it's a lot going on, but I mean, I had nothing else to do. So I'm sitting there researching it and trying to find out more about it and got really interested in it. And it was great because all the doctors were there and they were able to tell me about it and learned a lot about Asterius and um, the trials they've been through and everything else. And they presented to me a lot of great knowledge with, okay, here's what we think could happen, here's what could go wrong, but they, they had, I mean, it's a clinical trial, you, you don't know what's gonna happen. So luckily the risks, or the benefits outweighed the risks where I could potentially get used to my hands back and my arms, um, but like worst case scenario, things go bad, my body rejects it, like I said with the uh, immunosuppressants. Um, so I ended up weighing it and on July 7th, uh, 28 days after my injury, the mark off was 30 days, so I kind of cut it close there. but. Um, Got the stem cells, got 10 million embryonic stem cells directly injected into my neck, into my spinal cord, and um, went through with the surgery. And it wasn't a big deal compared to my other surgery. Uh, a lot lighter. I think the worst part was I had to fast for the day, and it kept getting pushed out. 
and I thought it was going to be in the morning, but I'm being at night. I'm so hungry. But uh, anyway, <laughs> spent, a, spent a day in the ICU after and um, uh, just had a bad, really bad headache But because um, I lost a lot of spinal fluid from the surgery. Um, but from there, went to recover and then went down into rehab where I was monitored throughout Santa Clara throughout um, my stay for the stem cells. And that mainly was a lot of um, monitoring the immunosuppressants, um, monitoring doing different blood work, spinal taps, strength testing, things like that to just make sure I was safe. So it was, it was good. I had to be there for 60 days. They monitored me really closely 60 days. And then from there, I was actually able to luckily go off and get uh, more therapy at Craig. So I was able to get the best of both worlds with the uh, um, therapy and the trial at Santa Clara and then go on to Craig to do more therapy. But um, it, was, it was definitely, it was a good, it was a good experience, I guess, as good as it could be. Um, the therapy there and then at Craig and then from there I was able to make it back in time home for the holidays and spend time with my family and then went back out for outpatient therapy. And then from there just got prepared with that goal in mind still to go back to Cal Poly. So I took a gap year, did more therapy, took another summer, and then ended up heading back to Cal Poly to go through my first year. And um, I'm back now this summer and I'm doing more therapy, trying to go back to be completely independent this next year. So another big step, but I'm excited to, to keep going through it. And um, a question I get a lot about the stem cells obviously is, is did they work? Did, like what happened with it? And um, I think it's really hard, hard, that's a hard question to answer because there's a lot of natural recovery that happens with spinal cords anyway. And because of the timing, it had to be so early on. But there's a lot of natural recovery that happens in the first, I mean, even through the first one, one to two years of a spinal cord injury. But even especially in the first six months. So you have the rehab, you have natural recovery, and then you have stem cells. So there's so much going on. But uh, what I can say is I was barely able to lift my arms at first. And now I can appear at least pretty functional with my arms. And I could do, like, I can wiggle my finger a little bit here. Wasn't able supposed to do that, so that's kind of cool. Maybe all the cells went to my finger. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how it works. I'm sure. I'm sure you could explain it a little more. But um, even if it even if it didn't directly benefit my my own experience, my own recovery, um, it, it gave me hope at the time, and it was great because it was it was another thing to to think about, and I I never really I never really had this feeling of, of, I need to be out of a wheelchair, I need to do this, I need to recover. Because I've talked to people and they, they say, oh, I can't live my life like this. But I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm pretty accepting of it. I think that I can still live a pretty fulfilling life um, and even go through more than I could have before. Because I'd, I don't know where I'd be without this injury. I think it, that's an interesting thought. But um, is it better, is it worse? I don't know. All I know is I'm on a new path. It's given me a new path, I've changed my major. I have a new passion. Um, I've met a lot of people I wouldn't have before and experienced a lot of things I wouldn't have before, and I think that's awesome. So I think it's, it's a different experience than everyone else, but you only live life once, right? So have fun with it. Um, so again, um, I hope that even if it doesn't benefit me, it helps others in the future, being part of a clinical trial and being able to uh, advance this, this very exciting technology and very exciting medicine. Um, and I want to thank again everyone at CERN because they've been so accepting and so uh, personable throughout my entire experience. Um, they've definitely felt like they've been with me every step of the way. And um, they, they have been since day 28. I signed 32 pages of documents. I'm sure their names are there somewhere. So you're stuck with me whether you like it or not. But again, thank you for the opportunity. And I'm open to any questions. Um, first of all, I'm inspired by every single one of the patient advocates, including yourself. Your attitude, um, passion, and drive is surreal. Um, I wanted to know how you made a decision ultimately to go forward with the trial. I know I've heard Katie, for instance, in the past talk about how difficult it was for her um, and others to decide without necessarily talking to anyone. And I'm wondering if you talk, talk to anyone who had received the cells before you, did you make a decision using their help or did you just decide on your own that this was something you wanted to move forward with? Yeah, so that's an interesting point because I think 
with my circumstance, it's it's another clinical trial, but it's completely different from um, from other people's, like especially the other um, patient advocate speakers, because they have the time to research this and they know about it and they live their whole life with this, or majority of their lives with this. But I'm 10 days post accident and I'm still learning and I have this one. I mean, I have to learn about it as much as I can. So um, unfortunately, like with any clinical trial, it's, you can't really talk to people who have been through it really unless they make themselves public. So I didn't have that, but I was able to speak to the doctors and they were able to uh, run me through as much as they could with um, the, the phase one of the trial, because I was phase two, so I knew that it was at least safe with a low dosage. But um, it was a lot of just um, having, having faith, I guess, in, in, in what the work they've done so far and knowing that I wasn't the very first one, I think that'd be a lot harder to be the very first one, but I know that it's been successful, or not well, like successfully safe, so I thought might as well give it a shot because I thought the benefits really outweighed the risks and being able to um, participate in something like that is something kind of special, so I do that. Jake, so how long after the treatment did you start noticing more arm function? Yeah, so um, kind of throughout my entire recovery, it's it's so like what's different with other other conditions is it's day one, it's it's immediately completely paralyzed, and then by day seven, you can move your arms, and then each day you see a little more movement and strength as the swelling of the spinal cord goes down, and you start going through therapy and more movement. But um, it was kind of continuous, I would say. There were different landmarks because they I, I don't know exact days, but they had a lot of tests. Uh, like day one after, day three, day seven. It definitely wasn't overnight, um, but throughout my recovery, it was more and more. Uh, I don't remember the exact day, but I remember the day I'd, my finger first started wiggling. I was just laying in bed and I was looking at it, and I'd, it was always told to just kind of keep trying to move things because you don't know what's going to happen. And I was kind of leaned over my bed and I just kind of started wiggling. I'm like, I think that's moving. I didn't tell anyone. I didn't want to like freak my mom out if it wasn't real, so I didn't say anything. <laughs> didn't say anything until I knew for sure. Um, so yeah, it was just kind of slow progress. Jake, you said you're back home for the summer. I am. And working on doing therapy to be more independent. Tell us a little about what that looks like on a day-to-day -day basis for you. Yeah, so in my point through my recovery, I'm, it's not really learning. Um, you learn a lot more techniques and stuff, but it's more strength building and practice of different things. So one of the main things for me um, I can do a lot of things on my own, but like transfers, so from the bed to wheelchair, because I don't have a lot of arm strength, it's a lot of technique. So practicing that, going to therapy uh, twice a week, and then just trying to work out as much as I can. So I still go to the gym every day and try to figure out sort of routine to do, to try and strengthen the muscles that I do have innervated. Um, but it's, it's a lot of practice and a lot of time, especially in the mornings, because a lot of it is ADL type things, um, activities of daily living. So getting ready in the morning, that's what takes the longest. So it's just a lot of practice. Mm -hmm. Hi, Jake. It's Kristen Hello. here. It was so wonderful to meet you earlier. I'm so absolutely impressed and overcome by your story. I'm shedding a couple of tears here. So I, I wanted to know at what point, I mean, your attitude is just magnificent, and I hope you consider writing a book someday. It's such a wonderful story. But what do you attribute most of your success in terms of your attitude to? Was it faith in God? Was it your family? Was it just, I mean, just, it sounded like you just really miraculously accepted this huge life quake. Yeah, so it's difficult to pinpoint a moment because there's a lot of moments, but I'd say having the support I had from my family, from my community, from my friends, it's definitely huge because not, not having that, I've met people who were in the hospital alone and that, that would be terrible. But I had at least one of my parents every night staying with me. Um, <laughs> got to the point where I had to tell mom to go away a little bit. Um, <laughs> but that's just, that's just naturally gonna happen. But um, I'd say there's a couple things outside of my family that I really thought of and hung on to. And, one of them is where I was versus where I want to be. And that is where I was day one, um, how I'm lucky to be alive, how I'm lucky to be breathing on my own, how I'm lucky to be moving on my own, how I'm lucky to be independent, 
to where I want to be, where I'm able to be, how luckily for me, I don't have a condition that keeps getting worse. It, it's the other way around. It keeps getting better. So there's a lot of hope there. So that's, that's one thing. Another thing is um, kind of comparing it to other people in a sense that I could, well, while going through therapy, there's a lot of times you can look at other people because everyone's recovery is different. You can look at someone that walks out of the hospital and be like, damn, I wish I could do that. You know, you sit there and you're like, why can't that happen? But at the same time, you have someone that can't move anything looking at me saying the same thing. So I think that that definitely makes me appreciate where I'm at and um, be able to see how lucky I am that I can be independent and move on my own. And then um, the other thing is, is kind of where, what, what it's given me. So a different path and um, a, lot, a lot more passions and kind of like where I, I talked to a guy and I actually didn't believe it because he said um, he was like 20 years out. Um, he's a paraplegic, so he has it easy. But um, <laughs> he was saying that he, if he could go back and change it, he wouldn't. And I thought that's BS at first, but I thought about it. And it was kind of pretty eye-opening because I think I'll hit that one day. You know, right now, I don't, I don't know if I would because it's, it's completely different. But um, I think that I could get there. <laughs>